and sorrow and sorrow For I remember April and you Jazz 88.3 in the new jazz thing. Music there from Johnny Hartman, uh, and I'll remember April. Uh, welcome to our guest, Dr. Greg Ackerman. Uh, welcome to the new jazz thing, Greg. Thanks for having me, Vince. Um, so do I need to call you Dr. Greg, or uh, <laughs> is Greg okay? I appreciate it, and no, Greg is just wonderful. Excellent. Well, um, uh, congratulations on a fantastic book, and uh, something well-deserved uh, by Johnny Hartman, who, uh, as uh, most people have said, don't know much about Johnny Hartman uh, other than some of these iconic recordings like the ones we were just hearing there there the uh, collaboration with John Coltrane yeah. how did you uh, get interested in uh, Johnny Hartman yeah like most people you know I, I got interested in him through the album with Coltrane especially the track Lush Life mm -hmm. it was actually given to me first ever by a saxophone player here in San Diego named Johnny View who I got to play with a lot back in the day and so I've always known about it, and years later I thought, you know, I want to read about this Johnny Hartman guy. We all know about Coltrane, uh, but the singer seems to have not been talked about too much, and uh, there was no b book to read about. There was no biography. It's never been done. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, the task just fell to me, so I, I ran with it. So uh, a lot of people uh, love music and, uh, and probably have favorite artists and look up information about them and, and such but not many get a chance to actually write a book. How does uh, writing a book about this fall into what you do uh, for a living? Right. I'm a college professor of music out in South Carolina, USC Upstate is the name of the school. And I just, I'm a jazz scholar, jazz teacher. Uh, and I was just, just researching the, a lot uh, of music on John Coltrane and decided to branch out from there. And the more I pursued it, I just realized I loved the subject matter. Johnny Hartman turned out to be a very fascinating character. He passed away in 83. Mm -hmm. So although he wasn't available, obviously, uh, you know, there's still a lot of his family and his peers. He would have been 89 this year. So it was still time to, to talk to a lot of these people who were around who played with him and knew him. And it was a real treat to get to do that. So um, one of the, uh, you know, the distinguishing characteristics uh, of Johnny Hartman is that voice, uh, yeah. the voice. Um, in, uh, did, did, did Johnny feel that same way that he was gifted with a, a voice? I really think he did, and it was almost uh, a criticism on occasion that some crit critics or journalists wrote that uh, Johnny almost seems to, to phone it in because his voice was just so naturally lovely mm -hmm. that they maybe wanted some more out of him on occasion, or if they saw his nightclub shows that he seemed to maybe almost... Uh, re relax too much and fall back on the pure talent of it. But for the most part, nobody seemed to mind because that voice is so rich and wonderful to hear. Was, uh, was that uh, view by uh, critics or some critics, did that have anything to do with uh, the fact that Johnny Harmon sort of uh, went through his career in obscurity? Well, and, and it waned. It, you know, he had mm, some real good spikes right, right. and then it would dip away for a while. I think the bigger reason was just that he really hung to his ballad style of singing during many, many periods where it just wasn't commercially viable. And he, he never did the Bossa Nova album, for instance. He never did a Christmas album. He never did the Beatles tribute or a disco thing. He, he really just hung in there and wanted to do Cole Porter and Rodgers and Hart, and that just put him off the radar for many years at a time until eventually the trends would come around to him again. Mm -hmm. But it was hard for a lot of years for guys like that. So uh, we, we started things off, and the, the music that we're playing tonight uh, uh, f featuring Johnny Hartman is picked out by uh, Greg. And so uh, you picked out uh, a, a tune from Songs from the Heart, uh, his version of I'll Remember April. Uh, Why did you pick out that tune? Yeah, I, I let you, uh, thank you for letting me do that. It was his first ever album. It came out in 1955. I thought it would be good for the listeners to hear that he had already done some pretty good small combo jazz style records before he did the big album with Coltrane. This was many, several years earlier. Uh, Ralph Sharon is on the piano, and Ralph went on to play for four decades as Tony Bennett's main guy. And yet, uh, I was able to talk to him, he's still with us, and I asked him, hey, what did you think of uh, Johnny? Did you get to work with him other times? He said, no, I only worked with him that one day on that album. Uh, he met one day before to go some, over some arrangements. Never saw him again, never worked with him again, and yet, he, I asked, well, what did you think of working with him? And he said, 
you know, I've worked with some pretty good other singers, you know, and Johnny Hartman is the best male singer I ever worked with. And that says a lot uh, from a guy like Ralph Sharon, who's wow. played with everybody. And that was a session in 1955, and he's 90 years old now. Uh, that, that, I wanted to play that track so people uh, could, could hear the fact that uh, some people really held Johnny in high, high esteem. Well, um, I want to play a little bit more music here and, uh, and go to another tune, and, uh, but I wanted to uh, let folks know that uh, you're here in town and you're going to be uh, somewhere tomorrow night uh, signing books. Tell folks about that. Yeah, thanks, Vin. Uh, very excited about the opportunity to, to do a book signing here. and Just talk about the book and explain more about the music of Johnny Hartman. It's at Twigs Coffee Shop. They have a, a listening room, a meeting room right next to their shop, and that's at uh, 4590 Park Boulevard. Uh, in the University Heights area, right next to Madison Avenue, and uh, all the w the information is also on the website for the book johnnyhartmanbook.com. You can he definitely get all the in information there. 5:30 p.m. So finish up your work and come on by and listen to some good music and talk about Johnny Hartman with me. Excellent. Well, uh, you've got uh, this other tune from uh, All of Me, and you picked out uh, Blue Skies. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun to hear something upbeat and a, a big band sound. You know, Johnny Hartman was pitched as a balladeer most of the time, and that was his forte. But in the, in the mid-50s, they sometimes tried to pitch him as the swinging pop star of the day. And this is a good example of that. It's a good big band arrangement, but it kind of has that almost uh, Dean Martin kind of quality to it. We're chatting with Dr. Greg Ackerman. He's the author of The Last Balladeer, the Johnny Hartman story. And from uh, Johnny Hartman and the All of Me disc, this is Blue Skies. On the new jazz thing, Jazz 88.3. Nothing but blue, blue sky do I see. Blue birds singing a song. Nothing but blue birds all day long. Never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying Point three in the new jazz thing. Music there from Johnny Hartman from All of Me and Blue Skies. Our uh, guest this evening on the new jazz thing is Dr. Greg Ackerman. He's the author of The Last Balladeer, the Johnny Hartman story. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us tonight, Greg. Glad to be here, Vince. So, uh, what were some of the things that were, uh, were there some things that were really hard to find out? Uh, you know, you just uh, up until the very end, it didn't didn't know something about Johnny, and then it came out uh, right before you uh, went to press. And uh... well, strangely enough, as simple as it should have been was his birthplace. Uh, you look up in the various typical jazz uh, encyclopedias, and they all say Chicago, but somewhere along, and his birthday was also very confusing. There was three different versions of that. But I started to hear a couple of hints from some family. He was actually born in Louisiana. And the Chicago relatives were not very happy with the thought of that. They just they kind of liked the idea that he was one of theirs. Right. Uh, but I dug around and I actually got to see the birth certificate. And sure enough, he was born in Homa, Louisiana. And then the family migrated shortly after. So even just his birthplace was kind of a muddied thing that I didn't find out until almost the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you do uh, much traveling uh, to, to yeah. do this book? Or, uh, you know, in this age of email and things like that, uh, kind of how did you put that all together? Sure, so much of it, it can be done through email and internet research, but I definitely traveled. I, I went to the Library of Congress because they had a lot of Johnny Hartman uh, rarities there, out of print recordings or just never released things, recordings from the Newport Jazz Festival he had made. I mm. uh, spent a lot of time there going through that and then traveled to New York and I met with the family and some of the musicians that had worked with him for many years. And so the family's aware of the book, they're on board, they were very helpful and gave me lots of good interviews and interesting information. So uh, just tell us a little bit about this uh, kind of 
this renaissance of uh, Johnny Hartman uh, in connection with the bridges of Madison County. Um, uh, how did uh, how did that come to be? Uh, that that was a Clint uh, Clint Eastwood uh, um, right. movie, and he was a big fan of uh, of uh, jazz. And uh, did you get to talk to him or uh, find out about uh, his choice of that music? Well, I found out a lot about what he had done to come to, to pick Johnny's music. Back in 1949, uh, Eastwood's just a teenager sneaking into a, a nightclub, and he sees the Dizzy Gillespie big band with Johnny Hartman singing, and he remembered all the girls just went crazy for this guy. So now fast forward to around 1995, he's making the movie Bridges of Madison County. He knows he wants some real romantic music and remembers Johnny Hartman, and he, he basically bought the rights to a whole album and uh, put many of the songs in the movie. And so in 95, uh, it was number one in the jazz charts for the entire summer. He had a real spike in popularity everywhere. For unfortunately, he had been gone for 12 years and right. enjoy it personally. But his family got to enjoy that and know that Johnny's music was getting the notoriety it, it deserved. Mm -hmm. uh, you're uh, listening to uh, The New Jazz Thing on Jazz 88.3, KSDS HD1, and KSDS San Diego. Our guest is Dr. Craig Ackerman, and we're uh, talking about The Last Balladeer, the Johnny Hartman story, his uh, new biography of Johnny Hartman. Um, so uh, when you were uh, when you were doing some of this research, um, uh, what were some of the things that uh, did that you learned uh, about Johnny himself? What he said about his music? Did he feel like he was ever pigeonholed into being this ba last balladeer um, mm -hmm. character, or or did he want to do some other things? Well, oh, I appreciate you asking me that. He he faced that a lot in his career. Uh, mostly, he did get pigeonholed as a jazz singer. Mm -hmm. And he really felt that if I was a white singer, that wouldn't have been a problem. I, I would not have been sort of labeled that and to the point where he couldn't get out of it. Because uh, he sang all the same exact material as Tony Bennett and a lot of Frank Sinatra material. And yet those g gentlemen are never automatically labeled as jazz singers. Sometimes mm -hmm. they almost have to fight to be thought of as that. Right. And Johnny felt that, well, just because I'm black, I'm either a jazz guy or a blues guy or a gospel guy. And um, so he kind of uh, had to deal with that a lot of years where he wanted to sing just uh, he thought it was a general singer, mm -hmm. but he ended up mostly working in the jazz realm because that's where he could find the most work and the rec recording companies were willing to put out records that were more jazz than anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we haven't really talked about, uh, about kind of the, uh, the big recording of, uh, of Hartman uh, with Coltrane. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, and uh, again, that's kind of how I got introduced, uh, I think as a lot of people to Johnny Hartman was through that album, the uh, Coltrane and Hartman album. Um, can you tell us how uh, that album kind of uh, came to be? How did uh, Coltrane uh, get with Johnny Hartman? Yeah. Well, there are some rumors that the two of them played together in Dizzy Gillespie's big band, but they really never did. Their time did not overlap, despite what you might read or see out there. But they may have at least had the opportunity to hear each other. So years and years goes by, and John Coltrane is thinking, I need to, with his producer, they want to put out something that is a little bit more uh, commercially viable or just shows Coltrane in a different light. So they think, let's work with a singer, and Coltrane was all for it. Uh, he got to choose, and he remembered hearing Hartman years earlier. Uh, they, they literally just called him when he was on tour in Japan, actually. And uh, they said, when you get back to town, come check out Coltrane's show. And, and it went from there. They only did the three-hour session. They met the one time before. So that was the only rehearsal was sort of at, at a gig and after closing. They went and did a three-hour session, nailed these six songs that are on the album that are all considered definitive, practically. Beautiful stuff. Never played together again. Probably never even saw each other again. And then Coltrane died within four years. So they, they never had any follow-up. Um, did... Uh, did uh, Johnny uh, have any words to say about uh, about uh, his experience in recording mm -hmm. with uh, with Coltrane? Yeah, he really loved it, and he knew there was some good music being made, and he felt it was very special the way that you know that that came about that the two of them seemed to have some sort of equal standing when they played and performed together. That Coltrane was not trying to outflash the vocals; he really played that album as if he was an equal voice. To, you know that tenor saxophone and the male baritone, it's just beautiful blend, and they really milked it. Mm -hmm. um, later, years later, uh, you know, people have often used that album to set, set a romantic tone. For instance, at a date night or something, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, his wife is nicknamed Teddy. So I asked Teddy, did, did Johnny know that people used his album to basically sort of get romantic? And Johnny told his wife, "I'd much rather had made." 
royalties off of that romance aspect. You know, every time a guy got somewhere with a lady, yeah. if he got a royalty from that, he'd have made much more money than the record royalties. So he knew it. He, he knew people really liked the romantic side of his singing, and he was very proud of that. That's, he, he featured that, and he, he, was good, he was happy about it. Um, I had uh, read a story about uh, Billy Strayhorn's reaction to, uh, to Lush Life uh, after hearing it, and that um, he told uh, he, he had some words for Johnny or, or told Johnny that he really appreciated it. Any uh, yeah. insight on that, uh, on what uh, Billy Strayhorn thought about uh, Hartman and Coltrane's version of Lush Life? Right, and that was one of the little tidbits I was really glad to uncover because even in uh, the Billy Strayhorn biography that's very well written, there's no discussion about that. Mm. Um, and yet I, I uncovered some unpublished recording interviews of Hartman and he described exactly what had happened and that he did go to Billy Strayhorn's uh, hospital when he was on his deathbed and mm -hmm. visited him and, and that Strayhorn very clearly told him, I, you know, I really loved your rendition and it was just a wonderful treatment of my song. He was very unhappy with the very first recording of it with uh, Nat King Cole. Mm -hmm. So he was always very sensitive about who else might do something to his, so his song that he didn't like. But he did tell uh, Hartman, you know, thank you. It was wonderful. Um, so uh, and so, since we have this disc out and uh, and it's time for us to kind of end up, we're uh, we're gonna uh, play a tune from this. But first, um, Greg, tell folks again where you're gonna be tomorrow night and uh, yeah. what they're gonna be able to expect there. Thank you. One more time at Twigs Coffee Shop. That's 4590 Park Boulevard, University Heights, 5:30 p.m. Just come on down. If you want to get a book, I'd be happy to sell you one and sign it for you. But mostly we're just going to talk about the man and his music, and I'll play a little bit, and you can ask questions, and, and we'll, it'll just be a good time. Excellent. Um, and I can't, uh, I can't let you get out before we talk a little bit about this. Um, you're not just here in San Diego uh, for this. You've, uh, you actually lived here. Uh, tell us just a little bit about your history here in San Diego, Greg. Yeah, I, I was a San Diego State uh, beer drinking college student <laughs> once upon a time. Had a great time. I lived here for 15 years. I made my living the whole time as a, a piano player, so I played just about all the clubs and bars you are still talking about in your you know, jazz calendar. Mm -hmm. Worked with a lot of bands in the area and had a great time. So when I knew I wanted to try to feature the book in a few key cities, I, I picked this one for sure as a place I still have a, a bit of a network and a lot of uh, passion for the area. I just love it here, so mm -hmm. that's what's up. Well, uh, and tell folks where uh, on the internet they can find out more information about uh, the book and you. Yeah. I put together a website just for the book and lots of links to uh, video and audio. It's real simple to remember, johnnyhartmanbook.com. And uh, we'll put links to that and uh, the uh, Twigs uh, location and uh, website so you can get all of that um, out there on our uh, pages on Facebook and Twitter. And you can get to those through uh, our uh, show website at jazz88.org slash the new jazz thing. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, the tune we've picked to head out, uh, Greg. This is They Say It's Wonderful from the John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman disc. It's one of my favorite tracks on that disc. Uh, it, it's Irving Berlin's beautiful song, and it, it's a great example of that equal voice concept. If you, if it is, if you are going to play it all the way out, mm -hmm. the, the solo in it, it just really respects the melody. You know Coltrane knew the lyrics, and you, you can hear it in his playing. He wasn't just sort of... Uh, stomping all over, like waiting for the singer to get out of the way for the solo or something. He, he's, there's a real exchange of melody there going on, so that's why I picked it. Uh, well, uh, Greg, it's been uh, great to meet you. Uh, congratulations on a fantastic book uh, and a uh, well-deserved story of Johnny Hartman. Really appreciate you coming. Uh, best of luck with it and uh, all the things you got going on. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Dr. Craig Ackerman, uh, author of The Last Balladeer, The Johnny Hartman Story. And this from John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman is They Say It's Wonderful. On the new jazz thing, Jazz 88.3.